It is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have a question for the uh, Premier. Premier, you've ignored the uh, dire financial warnings from economists, opposition members, and credit rating agencies, but perhaps you simply need to hear from a member of your own caucus about the seriousness of a credit downgrade to sway you from sending Ontario back into a recession. In regards to Ontario's credit rating, now I admit it's back in 1994, but it was a wise remark all the same. The member for York Centre stated, this is a very serious indictment of the government's fiscal and order, economic policies, and unless the province gets its fiscal house in order, we will see more serious repercussions to the detriment of all Ontario citizens. Premier, members of your own caucus understand that the path you're taking is putting frontline services at risk. Will you again reconsider putting forward Question. the budget that you're planning to put forward and reconsider before we get a credit downgrade? If I heard the uh, Leader of the Opposition correctly, he said that was a quote from 1994. So um, we're in 2014, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we have, uh, we have uh, brought forward a plan to the people of Ontario. We will reintroduce a budget on uh, Monday, Mr. Speaker, that will uh, lay out that, uh, that plan again. And we will, if uh, if the budget is passed in the legislature, Mr. Speaker, we will move to implement that plan. And that plan focuses on the investments that we know are needed in order for the economy to thrive. Investments like infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, uh, public transit, Mr. Speaker, roads, bridges—the kinds of investments that uh, the member for Wellington Halton okay. Hills was talking about in his uh, in his statement a couple of days ago, Mr. Speaker. The kinds of investments that. Every yes, member sir. in this legislature knows are necessary in their communities in order for their communities to thrive. That's the foundation of our plan, Mr. Speaker, and I know we have a fundamental disagreement with Thank the you. Leader of the Opposition. Supplementary. Uh, well, I remind the Premier that Mike Harris was gone 11 years ago, and you keep quoting him. So. <laughs> well, I guess that's going to stop now, is it? Uh, Premier, we don't have a fundamental disagreement on infrastructure. We had 2.9 built into our plan, our financial plan, to balance the budget should we have formed the government after the last election. You have $2.9 billion a year, uh, the same as we did. Uh, the roads have to be paved, the hospitals have to be built, the schools have to be built and maintained. We agree with that. That's a very small part of your spending. What we have a fundamental difference is you're continuing to go on a wild spending spree on the operating side. Jack Mintz says that if we get the downgrade, which Mostly everyone is expecting, except you. Um, if we get that downgrade, a 1% increase in interest rates could cost us, would cost us over $3 billion a year. $3 billion that will force you, if you don't change course, to cut frontline services like Question. health and education. There's no other type of mathematical equation possible. So will you change course, rethink your budget, we won't criticize you, and make sure you. that we don't get a Thank you. The, uh, the it, it, it's hard to come down on somebody when you make me laugh, Leader. So, um, the member from Prince Edward Hastings, the member from Bruce Grey Owen Sound, the Minister without Portfolio, and the Minister of Agriculture, come to order, please. You just did, now it's two. <clears throat> Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So uh, we've talked about the uh, the investments, whether it's in infrastructure, whether it's in the talent and skills of uh, our people, Mr. Speaker, whether it's in uh, in uh, partnering with businesses. Those are investments that are necessary. The other side of the uh, the plan, Mr. Speaker, is the path to balance. It is a recognition that we have uh, a fiscal challenge that we have to confront, and you know that path to balance is laid out in our budget that we will reintroduce on Monday. So for the 
uh, for the leader of the opposition to suggest that we are not paying attention to that is just it's just not true mr speaker we absolutely are but what we're not going to do is what he is, has suggested what his uh, what his party suggested during the election mr speaker we're not going to cut and slash across government we're not going to cut education we're not going to cut health care we're not going to cut deeply into the services that people yes, need we are going to make sure that children in this province have full day kindergarten, that there is more home care, Mr. Speaker, that personal support workers are able to do the work that we know is necessary to transform the health care system. Those are the Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Premier, with, uh, with a debt as large as the one that uh, your government has created, Ontario will be in real trouble if we continue in the direction that you're going. And the frontline services we depend on across the province will be affected at some point in time. The member, your member for Mississauga, Arendelle, understands this when he said that this accumulating debt is an unfair burden on our children and grandchildren, a burden we must address for our immediate and future economic prosperity. Premier, your permanent increases to Ontario's operating costs will have severe implications to our credit rating, our ability to pay down the debt, and our capacity to continue delivering frontline services. So I'm going to ask you again, will you change direction, take your time, fix the budget? Because there's no evidence in the budget you presented on May 1st that you're ever going to balance the books. Not by 2017, not by 2017, 2018. There is no evidence that you're ever aiming to balance the books. Show us the evidence or fix your budget you. so we don't get a downgrade. Thank you. Premier. Well, it's just not true that there's no evidence that we will be able to uh, eliminate the deficit. In fact, we're on target to eliminate the deficit by 2017-18, Mr. Speaker. We have met our deficit uh, reduction targets every single year. We are the leanest per capita spending government in the country, Mr. Speaker, and we are going to continue to have those constraints in place. But I would just ask the Leader of the Opposition to consider the impact. And you know, he, uh, he talked about Mike Harris, and the reason that we continue to talk about Mike Harris, quite apart from the fact that the platform that they ran on was totally reminiscent of uh, Mike yeah, Harris. Sure. But the reason we talk about that is because the impact of the cuts that he put in place have had long-term uh, have had, lo have had long-term influence on the economy of the province and on the societal fabric, Mr. Speaker. So if we do not, Mr. Speaker, if we do not invest in home care, if we do not have full-day kindergarten yes, place for every child across the province, Mr. Speaker. If we do not make the changes in health care that are necessary, I would ask him to consider what the future looks like if we don't make those investments, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And I would suggest that the future would be. I'm going to ask the uh, member from uh, Simcoe North to uh, come to order, please. <laughs> I'm not asking for a discussion. New question, the member from Nikki and Carlton. My question is as well for the Premier. Uh, she wants to talk about what the future will look like. Let's talk about the past decade. Over the past 11 years, our finances in this province have deteriorated. You have doubled the debt and you have lost hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs. And we are now a have-not province. And credit rating agencies are now telling us that we are going to see a downgrade. That's inevitable. Right now, the government borrows $11 billion a year just to pay interest on its debt. That is the third largest spending priority of that government. So think about it this way. To the members opposite, I say to you, every single dollar you spend on servicing the debt and the deficit is a dollar less for a hospital in our province or for kids in our classroom. So I ask the Premier, will the government do the responsible thing, refocus its budget, heed Question. economists' warning, and ensure that we have the sustainability for our value public services? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, again, I would say to the uh, member opposite, and I know that the President of the Treasury Board is going to want to uh, comment uh, in the supplementary, but Mr. Speaker, let me just say this, that I'm happy to talk about the last decade. Let's talk about the way we are uh, we have improved in terms of uh, students graduating from yeah, high school. When we came into office, Mr. Speaker, 68% of young people were graduating from high school. 83% of students wow. are graduating from high school. Wonderful. 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 And you know, the, the irresponsible heckle from the other 
side that undermines our excellent teachers, Mr. Speaker, to suggest that somehow that has to do with making high school easier. That's not the case, Mr. Speaker. What it's about is putting the supports in place that allow kids to succeed and not letting people fall through the cracks. That's what we have done over the last 10 years, Mr. Speaker. Those are the kinds of initiatives and investments that we will continue to make Thank because you. we know that that leads to a bright future for the province. Your question? Proceeding, please. Proceeding, please. Before I uh, start the clock, I'm going to make a comment. Um, I've tried a calmer way to ask you to come to order, and that's not working, so I'm going to jump right into warnings. Please. Thank you, thank you. Speaker, again to the Premier. You talk about people not falling through the cracks. 300,000 people woke up this morning without a manufacturing job. People are leaving this province, not coming to it like I did in my generation when there were a million jobs created over a decade ago by a previous administration because they knew the value of sustainable taxes. They knew the value of spending dollars wisely. I think it's important for the Premier and the members of her cabinet to understand what a credit downgrade will mean. It will mean increased borrowing costs. That means it's taken directly, money directly, out of our hospitals and out of our schools. It also means you're going to have to raise taxes, and that is going to come to a very difficult burden of middle-class families across this province who are already struggling with high hydro rates, high taxes, and, of course, higher gas and grocery Question. bills. So the Premier must understand she needs to refocus her budget. So will she give the credit rating agencies a signal of restraint and refocus her budget so that she can make sure there's no burden on existing programs? Thank you. The Minister of Energy is warned. Premier. President of the Treasury Board. Well, thank you, Speaker. Treasury Board. Uh, you know, all parties in this House agree that we need to get back to balance. Uh, we think we can do it. We are committed to doing it by 1718. The NDP made the same commitment in the election. I must say, you, you promised to get there a year earlier, but you also promised massive tax cuts which is not part of our plan, Speaker. Uh, so I, I just want to make a gentle reminder, Speaker, that these three plans were put before the people of Ontario. The member from Dufferin Caledon is warned. Carry on, please. There, there was a clear choice put to the people of Ontario, and on June 12th, the people of Ontario spoke. They preferred our plan of thoughtful, deliberate uh, uh, path to balance. They chose that over your plan of reckless cuts. The people have spoken, Speaker. Unfortunately for the government, so too have the credit rating agencies and noted economists. They have a gentle reminder for you, and I'll read from Jack Mintz. He says, and I quote, if interest rates rise to even historical norms, even each point increase in interest could add a minimum of a $3 billion annual interest payment, wow. which could severely cripple Ontario's ability to deliver services. That is a serious reminder to your government that you must learn to get this right. My daughter's generation depends on it. Our public services depend on it. Families across Ontario depend on it. You have to get something right. Will you refocus your budget, or are you going to let the credit rating agencies do it for you? Thank you. Well, uh, Speaker, with, with the greatest respect, if anybody needs to refocus their plan, it might be you. Uh, your plan In, in uh, uh, corporate taxes, that is not the way to go. If you're so concerned about the deficit, why are you promising massive tax cuts? Now is the time to be thoughtful. Oh, it creates a million jobs, perhaps, divided by eight. Speaker, I don't really want to get into the math, the math here, but my point, my point is, we have a plan. We are committed to achieving that plan. It is a thoughtful plan that protects services Answer. that matter to the people of this province. Thank you. New question. The Leader of the Third Party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. 
The Premier took an important step yesterday, Speaker. She finally admitted that the government may be preparing for the privatization of all or part of Hydro One, OPG or the LCBO. Specifically, the Premier said this may or may not be the outcome of the government's plan. Now, This was an important step in levelling with the public about the true nature of the plan that the Premier is cooking up for Ontario. Speaker. Will the Premier take the next step and admit that, in fact, her plan depends entirely on a fire sale of valuable public assets? Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, again, the uh, the leader of the third party is um, just um, not stating inaccuracies. It's yes, just not right. the case, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker. It's just not the case that what we have proposed. And if she wants to look at uh, the details on page 164 of the document that we uh, that we introduced, and we will reintroduce at the beginning of the week, Mr. Speaker, it lays out exactly what we are asking Ed Clark and his uh, his group to look at. And what that is, Mr. Speaker, is a response look at the assets that are owned by the people of Ontario to make sure that we optimize the value of those assets to the people of Ontario. But that's one part of the plan, Mr. Speaker. We have, uh, we have laid out uh, the investments that we are uh, going to make, Mr. Speaker, as, uh, as we uh, reintroduce the budget yes, on uh, Monday. We have laid out the constraints that we know have to continue to be in place, Mr. Speaker, and we have laid out the, uh, the uh, process for building the province up, all of which, Mr. Speaker, I hope that. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the Premier has appointed the current CEO and President of the TD Bank, Ed Clark, to look at how to sell off some of Ontario's most important public assets, like the LCBO, Hydro One, and the OPG. At the same time, she has asked Ed Clark's son, Bert Clark, the CEO of Infrastructure Ontario, with, the, the lead, with leading the sell-off of those very same assets, wow. Speaker. Now, isn't the Premier at all concerned that Ontarians would see this as a bit of a conflict of interest? So, Mr. Speaker, let me just let me just address that second point first, and just to say that the uh, the issues around conflict of interest uh, are being dealt with in terms of uh, it being very clear what the uh, lines of decision making are, Mr. Speaker, and all of that all of that is being tended to uh, appropriately. But I want to just read from the budget document um, should lay, to, to make it clear to the leader of the third party what we've asked. The Premier's Advisory Council on Government Assets, which is the group that uh, the leader of the third party is talking about, will examine how to get the most out of key government assets to generate better returns and revenues for Ontarians. The Council will report directly to the Premier of Ontario and be supported by existing resources within government. The Council has been given the mandate to maximize the, values, the value of these government assets to the province, including such measures as efficient governance, growth strategies, yes, corporate reorganization, mergers, acquisitions, and private public partnerships. The Council will give reference to continued government ownership of all core strategic assets. That is what Thank we laid you. out in the budget, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Speaker, as the current CEO of TD Bank, Ed Clark may have a remarkable CV, might be the most brilliant person on earth. But a lot of people have these kinds of credentials, Speaker. People who are not the dad of Infrastructure Ontario CEO. <laughs> now, the Premier has put together a plan whereby two members from one of Canada's wealthiest families are working both sides of a deal to sell off valuable public <laughs> assets. Now, isn't the Premier at all concerned about what this looks like to Ontarians? Or or is this just the regular liberal way, Speaker? Well, Mr. Speaker, the uh, the NDP way is to smear the reputation of reputable people, Mr. Speaker, who have expertise that is needed by government. So, Mr. Speaker, what we have done is we have asked someone with the expertise expertise that is necessary to look at things like selling our GM shares, Mr. Speaker, making
Finish, please. Making sure that our real estate assets, Mr. Speaker, are optimized. Those are the kinds of things that we have asked Ed Clark to look at, and we have done that within the context of very strict rules around uh, around conflict of interest, Mr. Speaker, and around integrity. So all of that is being Answer. tended to. Mr. Speaker, what I would say to the leader of the third party, I hope that I hope that she understands that vilifying vilifying the entire private sector and and vilifying people with expertise in the private sector is not responsible. Thank you. New question, leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is uh, for the Premier. Uh, the Liberal Trojan horse budget, which uh, masquerades as progressive, is full of surprises, Speaker. For example, the Premier has a plan to sell off public assets. She even knows how much she's going to be able to get for those assets that she's selling off. In fact, according to the budget, which she just uh, quoted at length, it's $3.15 billion. Speaker. And she's going to get a hand-picked father and son team taking care of both sides of that deal. Speaker. Now, How can the Premier say she may or may not be planning a fire sale of assets when she's already counted the money in her budget? <laughs> So, Mr. Speaker, I would just ask that the leader of the third party um, make it clear to the legislature and to the people of the province which part of the uh, the list of things that I'm going to go over right now that are in our budget that she does not that she does not support. So, for example, 4.2 billion dollars in school retrofits and builds, Mr. Speaker, a made in Ontario pension plan, Mr. Speaker. An increase in the Ontario Child Benefit, Mr. Speaker. An increase in social assistance benefits. $810 million to support adults with developmental disabilities, Mr. Speaker. The expansion of low-income health benefits, Mr. Speaker. $20 million for expanding the student nutrition program. $42 million to prevent and reduce homelessness, Mr. Speaker. I will complete the list in the supplementary, but I think it would be a very very good Answer. thing for the leader of the NDP and her members to say which of those things she doesn't support. Consider, please. Consider, please. Start the clock. Supplementary. Our list is pretty clear, Speaker. Massive privatization, massive sell-off of public assets, the likelihood of 100,000 people being fired. Those are things that are not progressive, Speaker. Those are things that New Democrats don't support. The budget says in black and white, Speaker, in black and white, that the government is looking at the sale of assets, including Crown Corporations, and I quote, including Crown Corporations such as Ontario Power Generation, Hydro One, the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. I have a question for the Premier. What other Crown Corporations are the Liberals perhaps planning to sell off? The OLG, the ROM, TVO, Infrastructure Ontario itself, Speaker? Maybe she can come clean with the entire list, the things that aren't actually spelt out. Question. In the Thank, you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And the flights of fancy that the Leader of the Opposition is uh, taking right now, Mr. Speaker, is really it's, uh, it's quite something. Let me, just, let me just continue, Mr. Speaker. Does she or does she not, and do her members or do they not support $50 million for a new local poverty reduction fund, Mr. Speaker? Do they or do they not support child care modernization and investments in early learning? Do they or do they not support wage increases for personal support workers? Do they support new funding for long-term care homes? Do they support in vitro fertilization funding? Do they, ex do they support expanded mental health and addictions? Uh, so the, uh, the member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek, is warned. Do they support a comprehensive Aboriginal action plan, Mr. Speaker? All of those initiatives yep. are part of the budget. Yep. Those are those are initiatives that yes, we will implement if we get passage of the budget, Mr. Speaker. And I sincerely hope that the Leader of the Opposition and all of her members from Toronto, from the North, from Niagara, that they will support us, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, speaker, the Liberals are awfully good at making lists, but they're really bad at getting things done in Ontario. Speaker. You know what? This 
that Liberal budget is masquerading as progressive, and it has other surprises other than the carte blanche sale of our Crown corporations and public assets. There's also the likelihood that 100,000 people in this province will lose their jobs as a result of this plan. So now, can Ontario be told? Can the people of Ontario be told by the premier how many families should be worried about the following list of people who might be lost to them uh, in terms of services? How many nurses are going to be gone? How many teaching assistants? How many child care workers? How many personal support workers? How many paramedics? How many firefighters and other public sector workers will be there when this budget is said and done? And fam I'm sorry. Um, I'll come back for your wrap-up. The, the Minister of Economic Development, uh, Employment and Infrastructure is warned. Finish, please. Point speaker from the Premier, the question is how many of these valuable public sector services are going to be lost? How many of these workers are going to be there when families need them at the end of question. this budget Thank implementation? You. Well, Mr. Speaker, the whole thrust of our budget and our plan that we ran on was to make the investments that are necessary for people in this province to, uh, to allow the economy to grow, Mr. Speaker, and to provide the services that we know people need. And it's very, very interesting to me, Mr. Speaker, that we are having the same debate with the NDP as we are having with the Conservatives. The fact is that we have taken a balanced and a rounded approach. We recognize that it is necessary to do things like make sure that our assets work for the people of Ontario, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. We understand that, but we also understand that making sure that the most vulnerable in this province have the support of their government and that we do everything, everything in our power to make sure that they get the resources that they need, that's what our budget is about and that's what you should be supporting. Do you see that, please? New question, the member for Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. My uh, question this morning is for the minister responsible for the Pan Am Games. Uh, Who is that? Minister, your government has continually seen cost overruns at the Pan Am Games, which are just over a year away. We originally heard that a lighting display on the Bloor Viaduct over the Don Valley Parkway was going to cost $1.8 million. Oh my. That's a lot of money, you must admit, for some Christmas lights. I want to know, Minister, can you tell us how far over budget that light project is now? What a good question. <laughs> Minister of uh, Tourism, Culture, Sport and Responsible for Pan Am, Pan American. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to uh, thank the member uh, opposite for the question and, uh, and congratulate him for uh, taking on this new role as critic and also thank the Premier for this opportunity to take on this exciting file. You know, Ontario is in such a good place when it comes to the Pan Am Games. We're going to really celebrate our athletes. We're going to celebrate our province, our country. And for the first time, for the first time in almost 100 years, uh, we've taken on a major multi-sport event. I guess the last one was back in the Commonwealth Games back in the 30s. We're going to take on a multinational event to really showcase what Ontario has to offer. And I'm so proud to take on this file. In regards to the, uh, the, the infrastructure project that the uh, member uh, questioned us about, that's a, a City of Toronto project. Um, oh. We have nothing to do with it at Infrastructure Ontario or through the Pan Am Games. So I would uh, ask him to yes, ask, uh, ask the, uh, the City Ford. Council who's responsible, Rob Ford, for Rob it, Ford. and they can get the answer from uh, the City of Toronto. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker. I'm not so sure if the uh, if the minister is actually correct on that. Uh, and while he's becoming Ontario's version of Clark Griswold, uh, costing us an awful lot of money on Christmas lights, this uh, Bloor Viaduct at the Pan Am Games is at a site that has absolutely nothing to do with any athletic venue. And I can tell you that that cost has now gone. Get this, I want to make sure he knows from 1.8 million dollars up to 4.6 million dollars for some lighting displays. Minister, I ask on the behalf of taxpayers of Ontario, what's it going to take for your government to actually bring the Pan Am Games in on budget and on schedule, or do you think that it's okay to continue to up the price, up the budgets, and just send the bill to the Ontario taxpayer? Thank you. Minister? 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think if the uh, the member opposite is going to criticize this government, the Pan Am Games, he's got to get his facts in order. Oh. The project he's talking about has nothing to do with the provincial government's. Uh, p uh... Member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound, you're warned. Finish, please. It has nothing to do with the provincial government's uh, operation within infra infrastructure Ontario. It's a city of Toronto project, but you know I have to say that uh, you know I'm excited about the games because we have 50 municipalities working with the province and the federal government to put on the Pan Am Games, and it's the first time I would say that you know 50 municipalities have come together in any major games uh, to uh, to really showcase what uh, Ontario has to offer. I'm very proud to take on this spell, very proud of our athletes, and very proud of Ontario for taking on this amazing. Responsibility. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. For a very, very long time now, there's been calls to this House to give the Ontario Ombudsman oversight of our health care system. Life and death events happen in our hospital every day. Sometimes things go wrong and people want answers. They turn to the Ontario Ombudsman an independent third party with investigating powers and ability to give them answers. Why won't this government give the Ontario Ombudsman oversight of our health care system? Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud that yesterday uh, my colleague, my seatmate, the President of the Treasury Board, introduced, reintroduced our Accountability Act, which includes a very important provision uh, in it, uh, the creation of the position of the patient ombudsman. Uh, this speaks to the essence of what we strive to do as a province and as a government, is focus on quality of care for patients, on customer service, on making sure that what we do through our health care system truly addresses the needs, the frontline services of those who most need them, individuals and their families. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I, uh, I'm also equally proud that our patient ombudsman is focusing. It gives us the ability to have an individually, individual who is wholly focused to one task, that's looking at our health care system and addressing patient needs, being the strongest possible advocate for our patients yes, and addressing those challenges that do come up from time to time, who are aspiring to ensure that the quality of care can be the best it possibly can. So I'm proud that we've introduced this. I look forward to it passing, hopefully, in the very near future. Thank you. Speaker, what people in Ontario want, what they have said they wanted is an independent officer. It is somebody they trust to be on their side. It is the third party that will give them answers, that will help them turn the page, that will help them gain closures when things go wrong in our health care system. And this is not what you're giving them. I asked the minister to look at the tens of thousands of petitions to this House, to look at the private members' bill that I've presented and the people that support them, to go on social media and look at the tens of thousands of people who ask you to do the right thing, to give the ombudsman oversight of our health care system, not a patient's ombudsman underneath Health Quality Ontario. I'd like the minister to, to explain Question. to Ontarians, to those tens of thousands of people who are asking you, why do you refuse to give the Ontario Ombudsman oversights of our health care system? Right. Thank you. Minister. You know, Mr. Speaker, I have to say I'm shocked because I'm used to very positive, constructive, useful information and criticism at times coming from the member opposite on the health care file. We welcome that, uh, that, that constructive criticism whenever it comes. But on this case, I have to profoundly disagree. This is an individual that doesn't have responsibility for a myriad of uh, priorities across the government, but is wholly focused on the health care system. It has all the powers of the ombudsman, Mr. Speaker, and is housed within the Health Quality Ontario, which in fact is an agency that the ombudsman of Ontario does have oversight for, but an individual that addresses all of the needs and the requirements that you've asked for. And quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, the, the many, many people that I've spoken to uh, about this actually prefer this option where it is a dedicated person that isn't, isn't focused on everything that yes, government sir. does, solely on improving our health care system and addressing that frontline service to patients, patient quality, making sure that Thank all you. the individuals and families across the province are truly have their needs met. 
Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister, Ontario has been a leader in making sure that the dignity and respect of everyone is upheld, regardless of where they come from, their sexual orientation or gender identification. Toby's Act is an important example of that, and my constituents want to ensure that the value the Act represents are also extended to inmates in the care of our correctional facilities. Speaker, through the Minister, what are we doing to ensure that inmates are treated with the respect and dignity that Ontario believes they should be treated with? Thank you, Minister of Community Safety and Personal Services. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Let me first uh, thank the, the, uh, the new member from Ottawa, Orleans, for, for her question and commitment to issues around human rights. And I want to congratulate her on her, on her election and look forward to very much working with her closely on this issue and many issues that impacts her uh, community. Uh, Speaker, uh, it was a tremendous day in 2012 when this legislature passed Toby's Act. I was personally very honored to work along with the MPP from Parkdale High Park and the MPP from Whitby, Oshawa, in marking a milestone in, in ensuring that we protect the gender identity and gender expression uh, of uh, Ontarians in our human rights code. We are the first province speaker to have uh, done so. And I am very much committed in making sure that under my Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services that our policies when it relates uh, to uh, our inmates uh, who come into correctional facilities comply Answer. with Toby's Act. And that's why I was present at the Ontario Human Rights Commission's launch of the guideline uh, based on the amended uh, code and look forward to Thank continue you. working with them. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, I'm happy to hear about ongoing advocacy as well as demonstrating that correctional institutions are respecting gender identity and expression. In the past, Ontarians and Canadians have fought to secure their freedom of choice in gender and sexual orientation. A recent media report, however, indicated that provincial inmates are still placed based on biological sex rather than their self-expression. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you tell my constituents of Ottawa Orleans what your ministry is doing to protect the rights and dignity of transgender and intersex inmates? Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And I want to be very clear in terms of what our current policy is when it comes to uh, inmates coming to correctional uh, facilities. I want to be clear that the current policy is that individual self-identification is the key consideration when determining placement in a correctional facility. This identification is made regardless whether or not the inmate has undergone medical treatments to align their physical bodies with their gender identity. In addition, Speaker, when transgender and intersex in inmates are first admitted to provincial correctional facilities, they are given the freedom to choose the gender of the officer who will perform the physical screening and even elect to have both male and female staff uh, present. This, uh, Speaker, is, is the current policy. As I mentioned earlier, we're working very closely with the Ontario Human Rights Commission to make sure that our new policy fully complies with the, uh, with, uh, uh, by, uh, with the, the guidelines that have been put out by the Human Rights Commission. And of course, uh, we will continue to consult with the trans community as well to make sure that their Thank point you. of view is taken into account. Thank you. Thank you. With the Minister of Environment. Minister, in 2003, the Ministry of the Environment released a report which found that the air in Beachville, in my riding of Oxford, had higher than acceptable particulate levels. The report laid out a plan that included annual site inspections, reviews of industry reports, and communications with our community. But your ministry won't give us any information. Minister, in my letter to you on the day that you were sworn in, I told you that I have asked for this information. I have now asked your ministry three times and haven't received a single response. What? Minister, can you tell me and my constituents what your ministry has done to ensure that the air that they are breathing is safe? Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I think these are some of the most important questions that we as ministers get, act, get asked in the House. And uh, I, I respect my friend from Oxford for holding me and the government account. Uh, I apologize sincerely. I have only been the minister for a couple of weeks that we did not get back to. I have not personally seen your letter yet. I would ask that to me, if you can take a few minutes after question period, uh, I'd like to chat with you. I will go back to my office promptly after review that letter, and I will have an answer with you.
as soon as possible. And I, again, I apologize we weren't able to. Uh, do that. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you very much, Minister. Minister, since you didn't address the beach failure uh, quality in your response, I'm assuming, as you said, that you have not read the letter and also have not looked at the information. People in my riding are depending on your ministry to ensure that the air they breathe is safe. It's not acceptable for the ministry to simply refuse to provide the information on what is, if anything, has been done. And this is over a year, period of the, uh, since 2003, Minister. Minister, will you commit to provide me within two weeks a full package, including the results of the annual site inspections, review of industry reports, and the steps that have been taken? And if you will commit to work with us to ensure that the air quality in the Beachville area is safe for the people of Beachville. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I will go back to the ministry. I will find out what information I'm legally allowed to release, and I will certainly uh, make sure that anything that I, as minister, can release without compromising the integrity of the ministry or, or the process will do that. Uh, I'm very concerned about uh, the air quality in Beachville, as we are across Ontario. The Premier and I this morning were with a large number of children uh, confirming uh, the, the reintroduction of uh, the End to Coal Act. Uh, as you know, that was the equivalent of taking uh, all of the cars in Ontario, but 7 million cars off our road, and was the single biggest uh, reduction in emissions, in greenhouse gas emissions, but it was also one of the single biggest uh, 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 reductions in nitric oxide in particular matter, which is that matter. When I came back to Ontario after being away in 2005, there were 53 smog uh, days that year alone, 53 days where it wasn't safe to go outside. And so, uh, pardon me? Much better. So, so these are, this is obviously a great concern. I think it's one Thank that I'll share with the member, certainly prior to the government, and we'll work with the on that. New question, the member from Windsor, Tecumseh. Okay. Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Good morning, Minister. Congratulations on your new appointment. Speaker, climate change is having a real impact on our province. Just last year, we experienced the most expensive natural disaster in Ontario to date. But this government isn't taking the problem seriously. This morning, the Environmental Commissioner revealed Ontario's emissions are set to rise. This government is not on track to meet its own emissions reduction targets for 2020. In fact, they'll miss the mark by almost 20 percent. As the Environment Commissioner said, the province has lost the leadership position it once had. Speaker. Will the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change explain why this government will fail to meet its own 2020 emissions reduction targets? Thank you, Minister of the Environment and uh, Climate Change. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, just two points quickly. One, I'd like to congratulate the member on his re-election and all his appointment as my critic. Uh, we seem to be uh, we seem to be paired up, and uh, I'll look forward uh, to many good mornings and return them uh, as well. Um, uh, I, 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 let's just look at what reality is as opposed to projection. Yes. The reality is uh, it was confirmed in the last 24 hours that we will actually exceed our 2014 goals. We will actually uh, reduce GHGs more than our plan called for. Uh, the Premier obviously believes that more should be done, and so we be, we've become a government where there is a Minister of Climate Change, which is myself, uh, to do what I think uh, the, the Environmental Commissioner said, is that stronger action is needed across multiple ministries, and that must be coordinated under the leadership of the Premier and myself working and sir, with her. Uh, and I'll, I, will, I will get into some more detail about that, what that will look like, because we are determined to meet our 2020 goals. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Some would say it's uh, one thing to rename a ministry, and it's quite another to actually deliver on one's commitments. We've heard today from the Independent Environment Commissioner that this government is not doing enough to cut greenhouse gas emissions and to address the impacts of climate change on our economy and, Speaker, on our communities. Worst of all, Ontario's transportation emissions reduction target has been cut by 80 percent. As the Commissioner said, I have been given no reason why and no explanation about what the Ontario government plans to do instead. So, Speaker, will the minister admit that this government is cutting its own targets because it has no plan to actually cut emissions by 2020? Minister. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I try to be helpful with my advice to my friend, and the people who live in glass houses, uh, especially these days, should not throw stones. We actually have a plan, and he may have noticed because we just came out of the election, their party was completely silent on the environment in their there, yeah. there. and uh, I barely could find the word climate change in it. So, like so many I listen very carefully to the environmental commissioner, and we're already moving on those things. One of the the environmental commissioner was asked in his press conference that I attended, "What were the three things we could move on?" What, and what was his strongest advice for the government? He said, first, transit and transportation." The big move, $29 billion, uh, and we, we started, uh, and I, I'll be working with Minister Duga and Mr. Del Duca on, uh, on regional express rail. This will be the biggest shift, uh, doubling the number of people on yes, and electrifying our system. That is a huge commitment that will help us uh, do that. Um, Mr. Speaker, I conclude by saying buildings, places to grow, new buildings. Thank you. New question. A member from Kingston and the Islands. Yeah. The question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services, whom I'd like to congratulate on her new position. Minister, as the proud member for Kingston and the Islands, I'm happy to report that I have learned that Community Living Kingston, located in my riding, has recently received new funding for an exciting project from the Ministry of Community and Social Services Developmental Services Innovation Fund. This is one of the many new grants to various developmental service agencies across the province, all designed to support these agencies as they work to promote the inclusion and employment of adults with developmental disabilities and to improve services for individuals and families. Developmental services in Ontario are undergoing an important transformation so Question. that individuals can receive care closer to their families and friends and lead to independent lives in inclusive communities. Mr. Speaker, can the minister further explain the intent of the Developmental Services Innovation Fund and its investments in agencies across the province? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Kingston and the Islands for this question. I think uh, as we've come to see her in action over the last few days, we know she's going to be a tremendous asset to this House, and in her new role, she will continue to serve her, her constituents. And so to the question, the member is right. The Developmental Services Innovation Fund is an example of an exciting step forward as we continue to strengthen the way we provide services to those with developmental disabilities, supporting projects that promote inclusion and help people with developmental disabilities find meaningful work is part of the government's economic plan that is creating jobs for today and tomorrow. Our government is proud to support these innovative partnerships with agencies in Kingston and the Islands, as well as about 50 other ridings across the province. These investments will be a critical step in helping people with developmental Answer. disabilities gain employment and lead more enriched and fulfilling lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Minister. A truly inclusive society is a goal that we all have a shared responsibility to work towards. I am pleased to share that a program known as Youth Connect, designed and implemented by Community Living Kingston, will benefit from an investment from Disability Services Innovation Fund. This project will develop social, recreational and employment opportunities from, for youth aged 6 to 22 who have a developmental disability. The target population is youth leaving school in the next few years and or leaving the child welfare system. Youth Connect will assist young people to explore interests, develop connections by accessing community resources and provide coordinated support from volunteers and peers. Ten youth will have an opportunity to build and create a sustainable mentoring Question. relationship. Mr. Speaker, can the minister share the other types of projects that the fund will invest in as well as other ranges of individuals who will benefit from these efforts? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
The DS Innovation Fund will support projects from across the province that encourage alternatives to traditional models of support. Examples of proposed initiatives include pre-employment training, volunteer matching and employer awareness initiatives. As the member from Kingston and the Islands knows from her own writing, a portion of these funds will benefit youth transitioning from high school and initiatives will also serve individuals with a range of needs and circumstances including individuals who also have complex health and physical challenges and post-secondary students and other adults with developmental disabilities. Building on this fund and other investments to date, the budget tabled on May 1st to be reintroduced next week will propose an additional $810 million over three years to further strengthen developmental services in Ontario. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure members on all sides of this House want to support individuals with developmental disabilities, and they can do that in a very Thank practical you. way next week and vote for the budget. Here, here. New question, a member from Nicholson. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Uh, Premier, just over six months ago, the Auditor General issued a damning report of your government's fire sale of Ontario Northland. It said your ill-conceived plan would not save Ontario taxpayers $265 million, as you claimed, but actually cost taxpayers $820 million. Now, despite widespread community opposition in northeastern Ontario, you're plowing ahead with the sale of ONTC's telecom arm, Ontera. Yesterday, you announced the termination of 70 employees of Ontera. We know the Ontera sale will actually cost the taxpayer between 50 and 70 million dollars. Oh. Premier, how can you possibly oh, proceed with the sale of Ontario Question. at that cost when you're already running a 12 and a half billion dollar deficit? Thank you. Minister, Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Minister well, of Northern Mr. Development and Mines. Thank you. I appreciate the question. Let me remind the member and <clears throat> other members of the House that when, uh, before Premier Wynne came into office in February 2013, our approach, uh, quite frankly, was to move forward with the full divestment of the ONTC. Premier Wynne asked us to look at that far more carefully and to consult with uh, stakeholders in northeastern Ontario. And we set up a uh, ministerial advisory committee and did some substantial work. And a couple of months ago, made the announcement that four of the five lines of the Ontario North that will be saying in public hands. And they will continue to operate the motor coach, the refurbishment, Polar Bear Express, and rail freight. The decision was indeed that it made sense from, a, quite frankly, a fiscal point of view. And may I say it's ironic that this member is asking the question because he was quite supportive of privatization on, on a number of occasions. The fact is that the decision to, to uh, sell on Jared Bell Line was made yes, on sir. the basis of what was the best interest of us long-term sustainable telecommunications leopard. I'll look forward in the supplement Thank you. To providing some more details in that regard, but the bottom Thank line, you. Mr. Speaker, is that we. Supplementary. Thank you. Back to the Premier. I'll remind you that uh, you only changed your approach after we approved that there were no savings to the government. Premier, this Ontario sale will actually cost you tens of millions of dollars and hurt the regional economy of northeastern Ontario. On top of this, your government stands idly by while Ontario Northland could be pursuing opportunities to refurbish rail tanker cars when the feds change their safety standards. That could add hundreds of jobs and add value to the government. And you still haven't given the transportation and telecom experts at ONTC a seat at the table with the ring of fire discussions. These are your experts in moving ore. They've been the experts in Ontario for over a hundred years. Premier, call them, don't fire them. Why do you refuse to recognize Ontario Northland provides critical infrastructure for all of Ontario? Minister. Mr. Mr. Speaker, we are extremely eager to move forward on a number of discussions, particularly related to the refurbishment opportunities. Uh, we, there are some synergies, we think, with Metro Links, which I, I have an opportunity to have a brief discussion with the new Minister of Transportation about. We are indeed open to all kinds of interesting discussions related to uh, the ONTC and potential role in other operations in the North. The fact is the decision on Ontario was a tough one. Uh, the fact is that I think the uh, private sector is far better equipped to handle 
the uh, future sustainability of the operation. It's always extremely difficult when ultimately discussions take place that result in, uh, in any job losses at all. But this will ensure the long-term sustainability of the telecommunications side of the, of, the, of the business and will allow us to focus very, very strongly on the transportation uh, needs and infrastructure opportunities in Northeastern yes, Ontario, sir. which the ONTC gives us. So keeping those four lines in public hands was great news for everybody in Northeastern Thank Ontario. You. Your question, the member from Hamilton East, Tony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the minister responsible for infrastructure. Speaker, significant delays to the completion of Hamilton's Tim Horton Field Stadium were announced following a meeting of Hamilton City staff, the Tiger Cats, Infrastructure Ontario, and Ontario Sports Solutions, which, despite the name, is a foreign-led consortium to which the Ontario government gave the contract to. It's unconscionable, Speaker, that nothing appears to have been done between the government and its partners to coordinate a fix to the problem when this delay has been known for months. Speaker, this isn't just a venue waiting for the games to happen in 2015. The Hamilton Stadium has tenants pre- and post-Pan Parapan games, ready to use the building now. Speaker, why did the Liberals fail to make the timely completion of the Hamilton Stadium a priority? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is unfortunate that the Ticats organization and fans will not be able to utilize that stadium for their first few games. But, Mr. Speaker, let's put this into perspective. The Ticats organization and Ticats fans are soon going to have a brand new spanking stadium to be able to run onto the field to as part of the investments that this government is making. Mr. Speaker. I think everybody involved, including the Thai Cats organization, sees that as a fantastic way to ensure that, uh, that the Thai Cat organization is sustainable going on into the future. Mr. Speaker, this delay will be short term, Mr. Speaker. Uh, very soon in the summer, we'll see the Thai Cats run onto that stadium. But, Mr. Speaker, this is also an example uh, of a learning moment, I think, for the NDP, who oppose AFP projects. Had it not that this not yes, been an AFP project, it would have been Ontario taxpayers that might have been in, on the hook for any delay costs. That will not happen because of the constructive way this has been put together. Thank you, Speaker. Maybe I can enlighten the minister. Speaker, it's bad enough that the job hasn't been completely mishandled, but I am fortunate that the Ticats will receive $1 million per game lost revenue as, because of the delayed openings that you're spouting about. Ontario Sports Solutions has tried to prevent unionized workers from working on the Hamilton venue from the first time. You should have done that. And now we see that the true impact of, of the government not requiring local and unionized workers to do the jobs they know best in Hamilton. You gave it to a foreign consortium. Speaker, will this government finally see the ongoing errors of their ways and take immediate action to ensure that Hamilton Stadium gets completed at least by August 16th for their third game and the other venues be ready on the other Pan Am venues, which are behind the schedule too, which is going to cost the taxpayers of Ontario millions Question. more dollars? Minister. He's dead wrong, Mr. Speaker. Because this was done through an alternative financing procurement process, something the NDP are philosophically opposed to, this will not cost the taxpayers a cent, Mr. Speaker, because any delay costs are at the expense of the proponent. And, Mr. Speaker, that's important to state because had we have listened to the member opposite in his party in the way that they want to do projects in the old-fashioned way, taxpayers may have been on the hook for that. But, Mr. Speaker, the priority here is to ensure that that stadium is built as soon as possible. Mr. Speaker, it will be. The Hamilton Tiger Cats will be running onto that brand new field at some point this summer. We expect by the third game, Mr. Speaker, as soon as possible. The fact of the matter is, Hamilton and their, their football team are getting a brand new stadium, Mr. Speaker, and the Tiger Cats are getting it without having to put a penny forward. This is a good news story for Hamilton, despite what the member opposite is trying to keep these people to believe. No questions. The member from Durham. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Across the province, we are excited about the government's Refresh Wine and Grape Strategy. This is a plan that will help build up on the success of the original strategy that supported growth in the wine sector, including doubling the number of VQA wineries, creating 2,000 direct jobs across, 
<laughs> jobs, record grade production, and the development of prime tourist destinations. My riding of Durham has two outstanding v VQA wineries, Ocala and, and Orchards and Winery in Skugag, and Archibald Orchards in Estate Winery in Camden. My constituents, along with residents across Ontario, want to know how the government will ensure a robust and competitive future for Ontario's wine and grape industry. Thank you. Moving forward. Thank you. Well, time's up. Minister of Agriculture. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I want to uh, congratulate the Boone member from Durham. You know, before he arrived here on June the 12th, the member from Durham had a very distinguished career as an education trustee with the Peterborough, Victoria, Northumberland, and Clarington Separate School Board. He did a tremendous job in an education leader in that role, and we welcome him here to Queen's Park. I do know he wants me to answer his question, so I'll get to that. <laughs> Last December, Premier Wynn was in Niagara to announce that Ontario is building on the success of its weight and grape strategy by investing up to $75 billion over five years to grow the province's wine industry. With the new wine and grape strategy, Answer. Ontario is investing in the success of the long-term sustainability of its wines by establish an Ontario wine fund that will create incentives for job creation investment, and two, improving access to Ontario wines by Thank launching you. a pilot project to allow VQA wines. Thank you. Seated, please. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs for the update. My constituents will be thrilled to hear that we are expanding the government's wine and grape strategy and particularly exploring VQAO wine sales in farmers market. In my riding of Durham, we are fortunate to have many opportunities to shop locally in Oxbridge, at the Oxbridge farmers market and help local produ producers and others committed to local food market in their local production to our community. Many of my constituents are actively involved in a number of initiatives to expand opportunities in local food and marketing, and would be interesting to know how the wine and grape strategy will help support local food in Question. Durham. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, please provide details on how this strategy will help to promote local Thank food you. in Durham. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. That was an outstanding supplementary. <laughs> we're, uh, we're very committed to supporting the growth and expansion of Ontario's wine industry. As part of our wine and grape strategy, we've initiated a pilot project that will allow BQA wines to be sold at farmers markets across the province, including the outstanding farmers market, the Oxbridge Farmers Market. The pilot program will, one, make it easier for people to connect local food and the world-class wine made in this wonderful province, create economic opportunities for Ontario's wineries, and third, we'll celebrate the VQA wines that are crafted entirely, entirely, Mr. Speaker, from Ontario grown grapes, whether it's Prince Edward County, the Niagara Peninsula, or people. Thank you. I, uh, I am going to come to a new question, the member from Sarnia Lampton. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my uh, question is to the new Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Uh, Minister, Ontario's regulatory burden continues to threaten jobs in Sarnia-Lambton. Specialized, long-service employees of the energy, refining and petrochemical sectors are facing the real prospect of job loss. Industry is facing a potential for a critical labour shortage. At fault is a TSSA regulation that will force them from their jobs, experienced men and women who have worked for decades operating steam-driven equipment uh, with a special permit from your ministry under the TSSA. It will leave local industries short of labour and threaten operations. Minister Unifor, the union that represents these workers, is asking for a meeting with you and your ministry and staff. Will you agree Question. to meet with them before the summer is over? 
Thank Mr. you, uh, Speaker. And I want to uh, first uh, congratulate the member from Sarnia Lambton uh, for his re-election. Uh, thank him for the question. And uh, he's asked a question about one of the nine delegated authorities that uh, fall under our ministry's responsibility. And uh, as the uh, member uh, knows full well, the TSSA is an independent uh, body. Uh, that is self-regulating, self-funding. It receives no money from government. Uh, but I understand the question with respect to the specific training and the permitting uh, around those particular engineers and operators. I am uh, certainly prepared to have a discussion with them, uh, but I want to reinforce the point that uh, public safety is paramount when it comes to the TSSA activity. We obviously want to be reducing the burden to business. In fact, that's one of our key strategies and plan to help grow the economy and support jobs in Ontario. I will also be meeting with the uh, nine yes, chairs and CEOs of the delegated authority. So I'm happy to have a discussion uh, to see where we can uh, take this, because obviously we want to see people working in the province of Ontario. Thank you. The uh, member from Eglinton Lawrence on a point of order. Yeah, uh, point of order, Mr. Speaker. I seek unanimous consent to have a moment's silence and the lowering of the legislative flag for the unfortunate and sad uh, murder of uh, an elementary teacher the other day, Abshir Hassan. Lieutenant Lawrence is seeking unanimous consent to have a moment of silence for the uh, slain teacher. Do we agree? We would ask all members of the House to please rise for a moment of silence. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon. Thanks.